This episode of Middle East Files, Israeli War Excuse, a history of opportunistic Israel launching military operations for expansive goals. Could the alleged kidnapping be a false flag operation? Is Israel taking advantage of the volatile region? Israeli in the shadows, excuses of brutal killings, in this episode of Middle East Files. Welcome to this edition of Middle East Files. I'm your host, Lamis Karut. Operation Brothers Keeper, that's the narrative Israel used to bring back three Israeli settlers who were allegedly kidnapped. However, it is believed to be just a pretext for Israel to invade the West Bank and bomb Gaza with no reason whatsoever. Nonetheless, the timing of this offensive led by Israel has raised many questions about the schedule of the operation, which takes advantage of global events. On June 12, 2014, three Israeli settlers disappeared as they left the illegal settlement block in the occupied West Bank known as Itzion. Within hours, Israel blamed Hamas for kidnapping the settlers. Israel did not provide any evidence to back its kidnapping claim. Also, no Palestinian group claimed responsibility for the alleged kidnapping. It is worth noting that when the Palestinian resistance captured an Israeli soldier in June 2006, they did not hide it. They immediately announced the capture and set the terms for a prisoner swap. Five years later, Israel obliged and was forced to release 1,027 Palestinian prisoners. Despite the lack of evidence that Palestinians were behind the disappearance of the settlers, Israel launched a massive invasion of the West Bank. Air raids were also carried out against the besieged city of Gaza. The Israeli military dubbed its collective punishment of the Palestinian population Operation Brothers Keeper. The Zionist authorities claimed that the invasion of Palestinian towns in the West Bank was to search for the missing settlers. The scale of the operation was clearly larger than a search for three missing people. Keep in mind that Israel's apartheid practices already restrict movement in the West Bank. The West Bank is divided into 70 isolated cantons. There are also over 500 military checkpoints in the area that make it impossible for the alleged kidnappers to commute easily. The bodies of the missing settlers were found on June 30th. According to Israeli press, they were buried within a 10-minute drive from where they had disappeared. The location was also meters away from an Israeli military point. The timing of the Israeli operation also raises many questions. It coincides with the beginning of the Football World Cup. The incursion into the West Bank started two days after the fall of Mosul to the so-called Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. These events captured most of the global headlines, allowing for Israel to carry out its operation away from the media spotlight. Further elaborating on the Israeli invasion, is Mr. Isam Naman, and he is the former Lebanese minister as well as a political columnist. Why is it, in your opinion, that the Israeli entity is able to get away with these horrendous crimes and really no one condemns that, and specifically the international community? I think they are getting away with it for two reasons, for two main reasons. The first, the fact that the West in general 
are uh, is covering them up, always uh, supporting them and covering their crimes. The second reason is the weakness of the Arab world. Were the Arab world strong enough, I think the West itself would have different policy towards them, both the Arab Arabs and towards Israel. Arab rulers look after their own interests. And on the other hand, uh, we have uh, a pluralistic society divided by different religious sects. And of course, the West, as well as the Zionists, are playing on this diversity, this Arab diversity. So the Arabs, in fact, are against themselves. Well, is then the collective punishment that Israel's practicing at the moment considered a war crime? Well, they know it is a, it's, it's a crime against humanity. And it's committing war crimes. But of course, they don't feel that there is enough pressure from the Arabs and their allies, if there are allies for the Arabs nowadays, they don't feel that there is enough pressure for them to question Israel at least, or to ask Israel to be prosecuted before the uh, UN different agencies, especially uh, the UN security. Uh, most of the media is with the West and with Israel. But with the fight that the Palestinians are carrying successfully, this eventually will force the media in general to pay some attention at least to what's going on. And uh, eventually Israel will feel that it cannot go on this way. Because, you see, the Palestinians are able to, not only to defuse Israeli attack, but to make life for Israelis difficult in so many cities and kibbutzes. So the Israeli public will pressure the government and ask also for a pause in military activities. affair in Egypt to Munich and Black September, the Israeli army has had a dark side in carrying out military operations and hiding behind false flags. In 2006, the Israeli army tried to use a false flag when it declared war on Lebanon. It claimed the reason being two Israeli soldiers were taken by Hezbollah right at this point. It was later linked though that the true aim of the war on Lebanon had to do with weakening the resistant group Hezbollah. It is highly unusual, possibly unique in military history for a nation to mobilize and engage whole divisions or brigades in response to the death, injury or abduction of individual soldiers. This is how the Winograd Commission described Ehud Almord's decision to launch a war on Lebanon in the summer of 2006. The commission was set up by Israel to study the failure of the war against Lebanon. The aim of the war, as revealed in the commission's report, was to destroy the resistant capabilities of Hezbollah. However, the initial reason given for the war by Israel was to return two Israeli soldiers that were captured by Hezbollah. Israel has a long history of using any event as an excuse to launch a military aggression. 
the Israeli military doesn't always wait for an excuse. Sometimes it creates it with false flags operation. One of the most infamous Israeli false flags was in 1954. An Israeli spy ring carried out a terrorist bombing campaign against U.S. and British interests in Cairo. The aim of the operation was to incite the Western powers against pro-Palestinian Egyptian groups. The Egyptian government foiled the plot. Israel admitted to the plot 51 years later when it honored the terrorists involved. In 1972, Israel used the Black September attack on the Israeli Olympic team in Munich to launch a 20-year assassinations campaign. In April of 1973, an Israeli assassination team attacked Beirut, killing tens of civilians, along with three Palestinian leaders. Also in 1973, a team of 14 Mossad agents killed Moroccan waiter. Ahmad Bouchiki as part of this campaign in Lillehammer, Norway. The Israeli assassination squad mistook him for Abu Hassan Salami, a PLO leader who was linked to the American CIA. The Israeli Mossad blew up a car bomb on a crowded Beiruti street in 1979 that killed Salami along with eight innocent bystanders. While the Munich campaign was declared over its assassinations continue inside and out Palestine, perhaps the operation that most resembles the latest invasion in the West Bank happened in 2002. Israel used a bombing in the coastal town of Nitana to launch a full invasion of the West Bank as part of what the Ariel Sharon government called Operation Defensive Shield. The Israeli invaders committed the Jenin massacre in which dozens of Palestinian civilians were killed. Again, there was no evidence linking the Netanya bombing to any of those targeted by the military action. The latest military action by Israel comes at a time where its leadership has expressed its disapproval of Palestinian reconciliation. Since the National Unity Agreement was signed between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority last April, most Israeli leaders, including Benjamin Netanyahu, have stated that they will not accept the presence of Hamas in government. The wide-scale invasion of the West Bank can put just enough strain on the fragile unity agreement to break it. This would achieve one of Israel's main political objectives, which, of course, is not related to the death of the three settlers. Further shedding light on Israeli backoffs is Mr. Osama Hamdan, who's in charge of Hamas international relations. Mr. Osama, the first question I want to pose to you is Israel taking advantage of the events that's currently taking place in not just maybe the region, but around the world to further, if you want, its aggressive grip against the Palestinians? Well, it's clear that the Israelis are trying to take the advantage of from whatever is happening around the Palestinian situation. I have to mention here two important points. The Israelis believe that after they have undermined the peace process completely uh, and the situation, the regional situation, what's happening in Iraq and in, uh, in Syria, even in Egypt, <coughs> it's a good chance if they attack the Palestinians. No one will pay attention a lot for that and everyone will be busy with the issues in Iraq, Syria. So they are trying to do that. But I believe it's, uh, it can happen both sides when they are acting against Gaza or attacking Gaza. Uh, it may uh, drag all the attention towards Gaza and also cover what's happening in those areas. Uh, also, I have to say that uh, the, the, the Israelis are trying to m m make some, some, something while the World Cup is going on. Everyone is, is paying attention for the games, so no one will pay attention as it is supposed to be for the Persian cause. This is the way how the Israelis are, are dealing. I have to remind you and uh, everyone that in 1982 they started their invasion to Lebanon during the World Cup also. So every time they are trying to deal with the situation using something to cover what they are doing against the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. I have to say if the Palestinians are uh, counting on uh, the global leaders, uh, the Palestinian cause will be uh, destroyed from the first days because everyone knows that the United, that, uh, United Kingdom established uh, Israel and that was by the support of France, United States, etc. at that time. 
So the Palestinians are depending first of all on themselves and then on their allies who are supporting the cause and supporting the resistance against the occupation regardless to what is happening around as a fundamental issue. They are doing that as a fundamental belief for them to support the Palestinians and their cause to support the resistance regardless to the costs of the resistance. Uh, uh, I think this is the reason why the Palestinians are still standing against the Israelis because also uh, the, 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 the governments and the countries which was based on if I want to, to say on dictatorship or on the relations with Israel or they believe that Israel is their uh, uh, ally not uh, the, 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 the Arabs and the Muslims in, in the region they will support Israel whatever the Israelis have done um, as you are seeing now uh, when Israel bombs the Palestinians it's a self-defense when the Palestinians reacted against the Israelis it's an aggression against the Israelis and it's an attack or a terrorist attack against the, the Israelis uh, they, they use this kind of uh, hypocrisy uh, when they are dealing with the Palestinian cause. Israel has made gains of events taking place in the region to strengthen its oppressive grip against the Palestinians. But it's not only Palestine and Lebanon that Israel has used force against. Israel has taken advantage of turmoil in Yemen, Egypt and other Arab countries to further its settler project. On June 11th, forces headed by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi took control of Mosul, Iraq's second largest city. Israel took advantage of rapid developments in Iraq to launch its own military takeover in the West Bank. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also hurried to call for the division of Iraq by pledging support for the independence of Iraqi Kurdistan. Israel hopes to have an ally in Erbil after having established trade ties with its government. But this is not the first time that Israel takes advantage of regional volatility to launch a military operation that furthers its occupation of Palestine. Since its creation, Israel had tried to benefit from conflicts in the region. When violence swept Yemen following a 1948 coup, Israeli military and intelligence services airlifted 49,000 of Yemeni Jews to Palestine to jumpstart its Zionist occupation. Between 1950 and 1951, Zionist agents were accused of bombing Jewish community targets in Iraq. The terror campaign caused over 100,000 Iraqi Jews to flee to the Zionist entity. Again, the Israeli military was there to facilitate the process with the collapse of the Shah's rule in Iran. Ten years later, a similar exodus was organized from Morocco as political turmoil there threatened the throne of King Hassan II. During the Jordanian civil war that erupted in September 1970, diplomatic documents revealed that King Hussein of Jordan had requested Israeli assistance in his fight against the PLO. In 1981, during the first Persian Gulf War, Israel bombed a nuclear reactor in Iraq. Baghdad could not retaliate. Israel has also took advantage of natural disasters. Israel's military airlifted 8,000 Ethiopian Jews from famine-ravaged Sudan in 1984. But Sudan has also been a frequent target for Israeli airstrikes. In 1998, the U.S. set a precedent by bombing a pharmaceutical factory in Khartoum using cruise missiles. Its excuse was that the plants were affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Since then, Israel has carried out airstrikes against Sudan using the War on Terror label. 
In 2009, Israel bombed a convoy near the Egyptian border, killing 119 civilians. In 2012, Israeli jets destroyed a munitions factory south of Khartoum. Neither the U.S. nor Israel provided any evidence of Al-Qaeda presence in Khartoum. Finally, Israel took advantage of the war in Syria to carry out multiple attacks against the country. In the last two years, Israel has launched at least four strikes on Syrian targets around Damascus and near the coastal city of Latkia. Giving us an insight on Israel bombing every front is Mr. Suhail Natur, and he is the Central Committee member for the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. What do you make of the Israeli aggression that's taking place towards Gaza? And do you think maybe there's some kind of hidden agenda going on here? It's semi-hidden because politically uh, the government of Netanyahu was so clear, so ferocious in refusing the attempts on reuniting the Palestinian ranks lately. The, the Palestinians, after seven years of schism and antagonism between Hamas and Fatah, re arrived to have a one common uh, government. And this cabinet has to be followed by some steps to empower the Palestinian situation on a, a generous stand combining between the political uh, attempt and the capacity of the resistance of, of the people in the streets. Well, the Israelis began to feel the heat of the Palestinians, refusing every details of their oppression daily. Se uh, the sectarian uh, division of roads, uh, the blocks, uh, the paralyzing of the uh, families and the movement from West Bank to East Bank, the complete paralysis of the economy of the Palestinians, and uh, stopping even uh, the transfer of money by the banks, it is the, uh, pushing the Palestinian economy to de deteriorating completely, and this is unacceptable. Go to the failure of the negotiations adopted for a long time by Mr. Abu Mazen. It was something touching for the dissipation of any hope that the Israeli government is in, as promised that to accept two states. They are not accepting two states. Israel continues to be speaking about po the possibilities of this ground evasion. It keeps talking about. Do you think Israel will actually go through or do you think this is just talk? We have to take it as uh, the process uh, is the most recent. Until now, the beginning of the uh, military operation began slowly. It was beginning that as a, a searching for the killers of the three uh, colonialists, uh, settler colonialists. And then they, uh, they were transferring to not only the punishment of the Palestinians, but also to get back the fear inside the Palestinian society from the capacity of uh, uh, you know, the Israeli brutal uh, reactions. So the deterrence idea that the Israelis are trying to impose in the mentality of the Palestinians in order to paralyze their struggle. This is one uh, second uh, phase. Now the third is to inflict heavy uh, casualties and destruction in, West, uh, in Gaza especially, that demonstrating that you Palestinians, if you are thinking about resistance and some organizations like the Democratic Front, the Popular Front, Hamas, Islamic Jihad in Gaza, they are carrying guns, you're going to be punished differently than the West Bank. So trying to have a distinction in the situations, pushing the Palestinians to prefer to prefer to continue in calm, even if it's not reaching their independence from the yoke of the uh, occupation.
pretext of the alleged kidnap of three settlers came at a time of heightened tensions within the region, with ISIL taking control of Iraq's Mosul and media outlets being too busy with other news, such as the World Cup. International nations have largely been silent when it comes down to Israel's brutal aggressions, giving it an excuse to hide behind the shadows and continue its atrocities. Thanks so much for watching this edition of Middle East Files. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.